All right. There's a couple Sundays a year where I tell you guys that we need to do something, and this is going to be one of them. So, do me a favor. Take your imaginary car seat, car, car, your seat belt, and strap it in. All right, pull it. Now, I want to see it. I want to see it. Imaginary seat belt. Come on. Uh, hey, don't forget to strap in your husband too, Sandy. Come on, he couldn't do it himself. All right, there you go. All right. This passage we're hitting today is Acts chapter 15. As you know, we've been walking through the entire book of Acts. The reason I have you strap it in for this is Acts 15, it's not like a favorite passage of mine, but through my years of study, it's one of the top five chapters of Scripture that I have devoted, oh my goodness, 100 plus hours to in study. Just this chapter. And there's a reason behind it, and you're going to get that reason as we dive into this text, because this text, as we've talked about through this entire series, I believe there are things there for us just to know about, and I also believe that there's things in this Acts 15 that we need to take today and apply to us. So, as we get ready to dive into that, let me start off with this. Have you ever been so convinced of something that you've argued yourself senseless only to find out that you were wrong? Have you ever been so convinced of something that you pretty much argued yourself until you're blue in the face only to find out you're wrong? If, if you have a funny story that's like 3 to 15 seconds, go ahead and share that with your neighbor about what that topic might have been. Go ahead. Spouses you can share with each other. What is a topic that you argued so fervently but you ended up being wrong on it? Anybody? For example, it might be every year when you said the Steelers were going to the Super Bowl. I don't know. But just go ahead and share with your neighbor. So, it definitely ain't happening this year, Rita. All right. <laughs> so. Man, so there's a lot of people in here that you've really not been wrong on many things. All right? Sweet. Remind me to get some lottery numbers from you guys later, all right? Just saying, all right? Guys, as we dive into this text today, I want you to understand the underlying thing that's happening here. Because when we read this text, there's an emotion that I want you to understand. And that emotion comes from a group of people fighting for something they believe is completely right, completely justified, and you see strife from it. And we're about to unpack what happens here. But before we dive into this, you, you must understand what's going on. Paul and Barnabas, you know, we learned they're in the first missionary journey, pretty much in the middle of it. And they've just been released and now they've traveled. They're at this church. This church is mostly Gentile. And, and let's pick up what's going on. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Verse 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So let me stop here with this. Let me, let me, let's talk about what's happening here. Paul and Barnabas are going along through all these churches and talking about what salvation is and how to come to Jesus. And then God's chosen people of the Old Testament, people that are, are strict Judaism, they, they believe in the Jewish faith. They might be converts, but they're like, whoa, no, unless they do this, they can't be of us. So really, in sense, what's happening is this. You want to be a Christian, you must be a Jew first, then you can become a believer in Christ. And that's the weight that's being thrown here. And there's a reason why this just infuriates me. Because this is Acts 15. This is, this is 30, 20 to 30 years into the life of the church. And this really is the first big possibility for the first church split. This is the first possibility in the church's history for the first split. 
We can have rabbinic Christians and, you know, Gentile Christians. That, that's pretty much what it could go to if this doesn't get handled well. And the reason that this gets to me and like eats under my skin even today is because we did not learn from this. The church hasn't learned from this really. And if you want to know how I know the church hasn't learned from Acts chapter 15, it's because there's 36,000 different denominations of church today. That's how I know we haven't learned from this chapter of text. Because as Paul and Barnabas, there's not a small dissension among them as they're arguing about this. This really becomes an issue that needs to be argued because of this reason. Can we really add something to faith and grace for salvation? That's the first point. Can we really add something to faith and grace for salvation? And, and not to rail on a point, but my goodness, we, we see churches and people do it throughout history. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you want to be into the kingdom of God, yeah, you better pull out the wallet. It costs a little bit. You need to be willing to give back to God what is His in order to be saved. That's one of the biggest ones that we had through the medieval period. Oh, or my favorite, you know, oh, hey, you want to see your relatives in heaven? All you got to do is pay a little money. All you got to do, pay a little money and they'll go right there. Church, remember this. The church is the bride of Christ. But remember that the church is full of people. And where people are, sin can get involved. I need you to understand that. Church is the bride of Christ, but the church is the people. And where people are involved, sin can get a hold of. Therefore, yes, sin can get involved and a hold of the church. Not all churches out there are holy and righteous. Not all churches out there are Bible-believing Jesus Salvation Foundation churches. They have a title. Let's be honest. Some churches out there look more like the Eagles or the Country Club than they do the church. Let me give you an example. I shared this with a couple of the elders. Uh, as I was traveling down to Virginia Beach a couple weeks ago to see my roommate from college, we drove by a church, and I'm like, dude, that is a cool name for a church. I'm going to leave the name out because I don't want to disparage anybody. And then he goes, hey, let me tell you about this church. He goes, they have different levels of membership. And I'm like, okay, cool, what's that like? He goes, well, if you give a certain amount of money, you can become platinum or diamond members. And not only that, but it, it reflects where you get to sit. And if you're a diamond member, you get a hold of the pastor. The pastor will serve whatever you need. If you need dinner with the pastor, if you need prayer from the pastor, if you're a diamond member, that is, you're, he's at your beck and call. But if you're just a regular member, you're, <laughs> you're down here. And I'm sitting here and, and like, I know by the expression on his face, he's not lying to me. And I look at that and I'm like, my goodness, how in the world can you read this and get there? Because let's be honest, we can take a lot of things from this text and miscue them and like completely twist them. But man, that would be hard for me. And I'm a creative person. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I, I mean, like, you look at Jesus' text on the poor and the impoverished. I don't know how you get there. But church, that's some churches today because we have not learned from Acts 15 what this is all about. What this is all about is finding a relationship in Christ. But, you know, let, let's, now that's really far-fetched. You're like, man, we're doing awesome because we don't have that problem. But let me pick on a couple things that might be closer to home. Let's pick on a couple things that we might put more weight on than we should. When we talk about our service, we've debated worship style. We, we've debated communion. We've debated a lot of things because all of a sudden, whoa, 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 whoa. That's how I know it. So therefore, it's ingrained as part of what my faith is. So we can't touch that. And church, if you want to know my personal opinion from, you know, Scripture, what I interpret is this. The only thing that's ever off the table is that you have salvation through your independent relationship with Christ because He died on the cross and rose again three days later. That's the only thing that's not on the table. Anything else we can discuss. 
You want to discuss creation? Is it 24 hours literal? Is it figurative? You know, to, you know, whatever. We can discuss that. We can discuss a lot of things. But the only thing that's never really up for discussion is the fact that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and how that came about. And it's these texts and it's these things in the church that become divisive. And what I love about this text is when you read through the New Testament and especially the Pauline epistles and the Pauline literature, you really see who the character of Paul is. You really see his nature come out. And man, he was a bold person. Some of you think I'm bold. I, have, I don't hold a candle to Paul. I don't hold a candle to him. Because here's what happens. Starting in verse 6, and we're going to go all the way down to 11, it says this. The apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood. Now here's Peter first. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth... The Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. I need to stop there for a second. Because what he's referencing there is a couple chapters before, I think Acts chapter 10, we talked about Cornelius' conversion. You know, the, the guy was in the Roman cohort. And he wasn't circumcised. He didn't follow the ritual law, but the Holy Spirit chose him. But moving on. It says this, verse 9, And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? By placing a yoke on the necks of the disciples, that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. Let, let, me, let me get to what's happening here. Because what's happening with the Jewish people is they're looking back and they're holding their ritual law, their ritual rabbinic law, too much weight. Because what they're really saying is, hey, they have to be circumcised. If you don't know what that is, ask your neighbor, all right? The next thing, all right, you've got to get the bacon out of the house. If the ham's in the oven, you've got to throw that out. We've got to go. You've got to do, this is how you have to live. So in a sense, the Jewish audience is, hey, you want to follow Christ, be a Jew, and then you're a follower of Jesus. Post. And here's a problem with that. And Peter calls it out. Why would we do that when we have struggled for generations to hold to this? Church, let, let me put this on a, let me just dumb it down for lack of better terms. Do you realize what happened when Jesus came? First off, let, this is like going to be like theology 101 for dummies. I'm just going to say it like that. Jesus comes. If you don't know this or not, you know, Jesus pretty much took the Ten Commandments and turned them into two because we couldn't follow ten. That was just too, too much. So he encompassed the Ten Commandments in the two. If you don't believe me, what are the two commandments? The greatest two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't believe that encompasses the ten... Read one of the ten and see if it doesn't fall into one of the two. Because it does. I promise you. Alright? He does that. Then not only that, with Jesus coming and then through the cross and the resurrection, we no longer have to go through somebody else to talk to him. No more is there an annual, hey, the high priest is going to talk to God. We now have the comforter, the paraclete, the spirit to do that. And so what's probably frustrating to Peter is, guys, why are we trying to do this? And here it is. Ready? When we as people have been taught something for so long and it's ingrained in us, we refuse to give it over without a really tough fight. I, I have said this for a long time, and if you're in my classes, I say this a lot. A little bit of knowledge is probably the most dangerous thing in the church. A little bit of knowledge is the most dangerous thing in the church. I get it. Let me tell you how much I get it. This kid right here was raised traditional Baptist. All right? If you're a female, you, you didn't wear pants to church. You wore a dress. All right? That's just what it was. Because that's how it always had been. Some of you are like, amen, I know what you're talking about. I get it. 
All right? You went to Sunday. I mean, all right, hey, you know what? Kids in the audience or teenagers in the audience, let me tell you something. We're really lenient. You're allowed to be a little bit louder in here. You're allowed to move around at a little swifter pace. If I tried to run in church, somebody hit me in the, the head with something. I don't know if it was a stick or what it was. I know our kids are in Sunday school, and I don't know if Tammy's in here, but our Sunday school teachers, when I was a kid, they were allowed to grab you. <laughs> like, they were. But that was part of it growing up in that church setting. And, and what I'm saying is this. Are all traditions bad? No. They're not. But don't forget that no tradition is God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because there's times we take tradition and we make it God. The most important thing we have to remember is we want as many people to encounter the heart and soul of the Father, which is our salvation through Jesus. That's the God thing. When we elevate things to that level, that's the problem. And that's what's happening in Acts 15. They have to be circumcised. Let me tell you a little bit about that. If you don't know this truth, part of the story, maybe you've heard of this guy by the name of Timothy. Timothy later becomes one of the main players in the missionary journeys. If you don't know this, Timothy was so committed to converting people and talking to a Jewish audience that he got circumcised at a later age. I'm not kidding. Between the ages of 16 and 19, Timothy got circumcised. Uh, that, that's ridiculous. That's insane. But that's how much he cared about his witness. But he knew that didn't save him. But he didn't want that to be a hindrance in talking to people. Some of you ask me, like, Chase, you know, I know I'm not the most dressed up person sometimes, but like, Chase, why do you wear a tie on Sunday mornings all the time? Because I don't want this to be a stumbling block. Some of you like seeing me in a tie because I look awesome. I get that. I'm cool with that. If it helps you hear the message of God, amen, let's do it. I wear a tie, all right? No, and th that's what it is. It's knowing your audience, knowing your culture. And Timothy knew that. But the problem became here where this audience wanted something more. They wanted to add this to salvation. And we know the truth is this, that only the grace of Christ is what saves you. And church, that word grace is thrown around so much. And I don't know if we have a true good definition of what grace is. Do you understand that grace is not something you do? Do you understand that? Grace is nothing I do. For example, it's not a pastor thing either. It's not like I can leave the stage and be like, Reuben, you have grace now. It, that's not how this works. Grace is not rigorous. It's not a work. Grace is the free gift that God gave us through His Son. All you have to do is open it. And some of us get so resentful of that because it's like Christmas morning and there's presents under the tree and you're excited, but you don't want to open them. Who does that? No one. Nobody does that. And if you do, you're weird, okay? I'm just going to say it, all right? Now, granted, people open things differently. There's some people, let me tell you about the, the OCD people here for a second. There's those people that, you know, take the, the letter opener and they nicely slice the tape and they take it off piece by piece because for some reason you can save wrapping paper. I don't know who does that, but calling you out right now. All right, there's some people that do it that way. Or, you know, there's people like me. I'm a bull in a china shop. I see a present on a tree, I'm gonna devour that thing. I will rip that thing to pieces. If it's closed in there, you better tell me because I might rip the clothes in half. All right? And guys, that's how we need to attack the grace that we have from Christ. You should yearn for that. You should want it. And maybe you're saying, Chase, you talk about all this grace and about how we have gr grace through Jesus and that's how we're saved. But don't we have commandments to follow? Yes. But that comes later. Ready? You should not follow commandments given by God out of duty or rigor. You should follow commandments from God out of your adoration of the love we have because of grace. Your following is the response of the grace we have. Stop thinking, if I just do this, this, and this, I have Jesus. Let Jesus just be in and you follow that because you're so accepting of it. The reason this message is so important is because it is the basis of the theology of the New Testament and this is what the church is going to stand on. That salvation only comes through Jesus. 
Not through tradition. Not through how much money you give. Not through who you know. And I want you to understand something. When Peter talks in this text and he says, us and them. Because this was such a divisive issue. Jews saw Gentiles as extremely dirty people. There's a reason why when Jesus was on earth, the people he called out the most were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because, my goodness, they were racist people. And they didn't understand that God wanted people that might be lower than the station according to them. Because God made all creation equal. And he wants them all to know who he is. And then so the Jews may be like, well, Chase, what, if, what are we going to do with this? Because now they're saved and you say we're saved, but we still follow rabbinic law. Guess what? You have the freedom to do so. Let them have the freedom not to. That's, the, that's what we get when we follow Jesus. As long as you're not saying it's salvation, you can do that. I don't care if you prefer going to church on Saturday. That's fine. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't go to church on Saturday. There's nothing in the Bible that says Sunday has to be the day for church. Well, you know it or not. Those are things we look at. And those are things we get from this chapter. Let me continue on with this. Uh, before we close this chapter, I, I want to go to probably the greatest sentence that Paul wrote. And it's in, uh, it's in the book of Ephesians. Granted, that's my opinion. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. You know what? If you open your Bible, I'll read verse 9 for you. Not as a result of works, so that one may boast. For we are his workmanship. God has been molding us to this. Because let's be honest, if salvation was based on works, you know, sometimes I ask myself, would, would more people be saved? But, you know, probably not. If, if, if salvation was based on works, my goodness, could you imagine the competitiveness in church? Whew. We could have, like, scoreboards everywhere. We could have, like, charts and people's names. I'm serious. Who gave the most of the homeless this week? And we'd be like, right here, all right. We could be like, all right, who, who helped out with kids' church three times this month? And you're like, right here. And you'd be like, hey, Carl, what's going down here? Why are you down here, Carl? What's up? You know, look at me. I'm right here. Do more. And that's how, we, that's how that could be done. But that's why grace, salvation is not based on works. Because guess what? Our human nature, we would completely destroy that and defile that. Because we don't have grace and compassion for other people. It has to be a comparison game. Come on, we all do it. We all look at somebody near us in church and be like, hmm, I wonder if they're really truly walking on the righteous path. Come on, we do that. I'll be honest. Best place to people watch in town is Walmart. Best place. The best place to people watch. You go there and you're like, what in the world is going on? I'm serious. You know, Megan doesn't think I'm fashion trendy. I should try some things that I've seen on people at Walmart and then she would appreciate how I dress. I'm serious. <laughs> you know, let's be honest. They pick on the farmer for a minute. The farmer that walks in with his overalls on but has no undershirt underneath, I think that's a cool look. I bet I could pull that off. I might go for it next week, all right? But guys, that's not salvation. Salvation is only in our hands through Jesus. Nobody else is in charge of your salvation. Yes, you're in charge of witnessing to others, but it's yours. And that should mean something to you because that's because God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. And he yearns for that and he wants us to yearn for that as well. So this debate goes on and goes on and it closes with this. At the end of chapter 15, verses 30 to 35 says this. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation there, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. 32, and Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. 
And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those whom they had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. What you understand is Peter and James got together, wrote a letter, said, guys, stop being dumb. Here's what really salvation is. And so they delivered this. And people are encouraged by this. Because church, the gospel, if it's truly the gospel, it should unite people. The gospel should bring unity. If you're at a church and for some reason the gospel has caused disunity, it's not the gospel, it's people's interpretation of it and how they've, me and how they've messaged it. Because what the gospel message is, is anyone can come to Jesus. All you've got to do is open the gift of grace. That's the gospel on a very basic, shallow level. And then you might be saying, Chase, what's the deep level of it? Well, simple as this. If you've completed, let's call it step one for lack of better terms, if you've come to Jesus, then there are things you should know that you should be doing. Not out of ritual, but out of love and response. You should know what gifts God has given you. How to serve, how to do it. Let's be honest. I'll, I'll be the first to admit this. Um, every so often, I teach like an elementary Sunday school class downstairs. I only do that because Jesus has penetrated me. If I didn't have Jesus, I would not want to do that, period. I'm serious. Have you seen some of your kids? All right? I mean, yeah. Right? But guys, that's, that's what we do. Because out of, out of our love that Christ has done so much for us and God has, we want to serve. And God puts that in our heart. So, church, who are you going to be talking to this week? Who has God put on your heart to talk to? Maybe you've been talking to a coworker that they're to church, that, my goodness, to have, to have salvation, it's like A to M. Let them know that there are places out there that truly know the gospel message is salvation is only found through Christ, through the Son. Because those are people I don't mind bringing in. Yes, there are churches throughout our town that preach the gospel message just fine. Yes, keep, stay there. Maybe you're also wanting a deeper level and saying, Chase, I, I get that. I've known that for years, but I want more. If you want more, dive into study. You don't need me to feed you. If you know that and you have the basics and you know this is scripture, start reading. If you have questions, then ask me. Absolutely, I will answer any questions on that. And if I don't know, I'll say I'll try to find the answer for you. Because there are things in here that I read them and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Let me read for about 15 hours and figure out what that might mean. Church, if you want something deeper, start reading. Use the prayer journal to your, to your avail. When we start back up our small groups in the fall, join one for the deeper level. That's what that gets there is deeper level and community. There are options to grow, I promise you. You just got to be willing to take them. That's what church is. Church is us coming together as a community, a body of believers. And yes, conflict happens. Conflict happens with anything in life. But here's what breaks conflict. At the end of the day, if we all know that Jesus is king of my heart and of this place, nothing will separate us from each other. We could disagree on a multitude of things. Absolutely. You could hold firm to your belief that somehow the Pirates are going to win the World Series. Whatever. You, you do that. But because we both believe in Jesus, we're still going to be okay. I'm serious. Even in here, we can disagree on a couple things. But as long as we come to at the end of the conclusion that, you know what, I am saved through the blood of the cross through Jesus, there's no point to argue this anymore. If you've never, never accepted Jesus on this level of I, I need salvation and I want to open that free gift. I, I want to know what it's like to have Christ come into my heart. If you've never done that, I beg you and I implore you to have a conversation with me. If you feel awkward coming up front, you don't have to come up front. Find me. Tackle me. Mug me. I don't care. That's such an important conversation. I don't care what I'm doing. I will drop it for you. If I have a chicken wing in my hand, that's the one time I'll drop the chicken wing to talk to you, okay? So come on. Maybe you 
don't feel comfortable talking to me. Talk to somebody you know that belongs to Christ and believes in Him. We have a prayer team for that reason. I promise you this, nobody on our prayer team is like, I'm anti-believer in Jesus. We would not put people like that on our prayer team. So talk to them. Those are decisions you have today. And lastly, as I encourage you, and I'm going to be doing this every week in this series, who has God put on your heart? Because as we walk through the missionary journeys of Paul, that's what it was all about, is taking the gospel all the way to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8. All of Jerusalem, all of Judea, all of Samaria to the ends of the earth. How are we doing with that in our own neighborhood? That's what I have for this morning. Let's stand and sing. Before creation, eternity in your hands, you spoke the earth into motion. My soul now is the sand. You stood before my face. Weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now you said. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh
Hey, if you don't know that, you're allowed to clap in church. I promise you it's okay. All right, here we go. Prayer concerns I want you to lift up throughout the week and today, so listen up. Number one, we need to be lifting up Jesse Friedline in prayers uh, and the doctors so they can find out what's actually going on. Serious health issues, so make sure we're lifting up Jesse Friedline in prayers this week. Also, Bob Miller, as he's having continued health issues, so we'll be lifting him up. If you want more on that, talk to Millie. She'd be willing to talk to you about that. That's not a problem. So just be lifting those two up in prayer. So why don't you go ahead and bow with me. Lord, Father God, we thank you for who you are. God, we're so thankful we can come into your house and get excited. Because we should be. Because we do have grace through your Son. And it is an amazing thing that we get to walk through this life knowing that we are in your hand. God, we're so thankful for that. And at this time, we, we know through all the miracles of healing that that power is there. So we pray for these individuals. We pray for Jesse Friedline. We pray that you be there and just be over that situation. We also lift up Bob to you. We pray for a hand of healing on both and let you just transcend what's going on and be there with the doctor so they know what to do. God, we are so thankful for you. And most importantly, we are so thankful for your son. And we close out with the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing together how God made everything glorious, including you.